this is a, a, a summary of a paper that's a summary of a book, essentially. <laughs> Uh, but it's, uh, I, I just wanted to share some thoughts about what I've been thinking since some 2016 or even 2014 about this shifting uh, condition of, um, of information and, and, and online, online culture uh, that, that has been gradually encroaching. Uh, in our lives, uh, to me, in my life since 2014, Ukraine, uh, uh, you know, conflict. Uh, but um, you know, what, what's what's later being called uh, being called post truth. Uh, and uh, by, you know, there are plenty of, of ways that post truth is uh, defined, uh, and the popular. Uh, way of, co of of understanding it is is that it's you know a culture where uh, you know political decisions and political processes uh, rely on on emotional and populist sort of uh, uh, sentiments and and uh, fake knowledge uh, as opposed to factually based uh, knowledge and and uh, it's ruled by disinformation and well everyone probably knows knows the drill by now and uh, I would think that there's more to it uh, and uh, same as there's more to this uh, term uh, seen from the Terminator uh, with, with starring Sylvester Stallone um, and to those who, who've seen the film, they know that this is not Sylvester Stallone, uh, but there's more to this as well, because the, the, uh, the entire image is epochal uh, in our imagine, imaginary and our imagination about how technology is, is, is being used or is being infiltrated in our reality, right? So, so there's a, a, a a network of imaginations and imaginaries layered upon each other uh, in this uh, mediatized world of post-truth that we live in. Now, uh, uh, what I would like to argue is that in, in, this, uh, in this situation, we end up with a splitting kind of truth regime and a truth regime uh, I borrow from Foucault, uh, uh, also uh, Im implying that there is a certain power structure uh, beneath uh, beneath uh, uh, you know what what society considers true or untrue in uh, in in this world, and of course in the context of of the pandemic, this question question uh, emerges uh, ever more sharply uh, because. Uh, you know, scientific uh, narratives are being countered by by a variety of other kinds of narrative, with, which the scientific narrative then um, titles as pseudoscience, or, or um, you know, you, 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 there's plenty of, of names for it. Uh, but essentially, what I want to do is to talk about how to understand that other side of a narrative, uh, which I do not advocate, but I. Uh, I am interested in, um, and I think that it's it derives from a very specific uh, condition and, and uh, counter uh, what's the conflux of of uh, at least three major factors. The first one being, of course, the technology which is currently capable of producing empirical evidence that uh, or or. Uh, cr uh, fabricating empirical evidence uh, like never before. And in a sense, we are in a situation where we can no longer trust what we see. So we can no longer uh, rely completely on empirical evidence. And this way, the, the, the whole structure uh, of our knowledge building is, is, is uh, shaking. And uh, as an example, you can see uh, these faces of people uh, which are computer generated. None of these per persons exist. Uh, they are all fake. Uh, yet they have a, a different, uh, different reality uh, in a virtual world. Now, uh, this would be, you know, just a lie if we did not have a process of mediatization where uh, images and these 
phantasms, virtual phantasms, uh, attain their own political presence uh, as it was in, in Ukraine's context where, where, where Russia's uh, information attack, uh, but also, uh, you know, in other uh, more grassroots uh, contexts, such as in Trump's uh, campaigning uh, and the, among the, the supporters and in internet forums were memes uh, became uh, constitutive of uh, mm, an ideology or, or a, a set of uh, discourse uh, that, that kind of mobilized people to eventually uh, do, not, not only to, to strongly support Trump's claims, but, but also uh, to pursue uh, an attempt at a revolution, perhaps. So, so mediatization renders these phantasms, these, these symbolic, but also uh, uh, deeply powerful images, uh, po potent and, and meaningful politically. And of course, uh, this is motivated and motivates conspiracy theories, uh, layers upon layers of uh, uh, problems with that also rooted in in uh, in Gnostic narratives and and uh, and, and Manichaean uh, vision of the world and and whatnot. So I won't uh, delve much into it. Um, so what I would argue we encounter as a result is a type of performative politics, where. Uh, Next to uh, standard procedures, next to standard procedures of, of knowledge making and gover governmentality, we have uh, an influx of, uh, uh, of uh, politics that is uh, essentially uh, theatrical, essentially symbolic. Uh, and through and functions rather through uh, than functioning through argumentation and empirical evidence, it functions through representation uh, and performative enactment or establishment of of political reality. Uh, so examples of that could be uh, the the toppling of, of various uh, monuments uh, depicting, you know. 19th, 20th century colonial uh, power, or it could be cancel culture that uh, kind of through a discourse uh, uh, represses uh, one or another uh, public figure uh, in, 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 a, in a public sort of performative uh, Mm, degrading of uh, of a narrative that is not uh, considered uh, uh, adequate or uh, represent you know properly representing the 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 reality it is discussing and of course the rise of uh, of performative leaders uh, not not excluding the rapper Kanye West trying to or having ideas of of becoming a president. And I, I know personally uh, uh, quite a few young people who found this uh, idea quite entertaining for one, but, but attractive uh, for second, because there's a deep disappointment with the knowledge system and, and expertise-based uh, knowledge uh, or, or, or based uh, public uh, management, so to say, uh, that uh, that Paul was talking about. So uh, you know, and uh, so, so we, we have this clash of of uh, of you know institutions that, uh, and and status quo that that relies on on all these technological, bureaucratic, technocratic. Power, uh, power institutions that we discussed, but also on the other hand, uh, a purely symbolic, a purely uh, imaginary driven performative uh, political power from the grassroots that kind of uh, clashes with, 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 this, with, this, uh, with this status quo. Uh, and the reason I'm giving this as an example is uh, because 
the flag here is of a, you know, it's it's uh, related to to far right movements, but but what's important is that it's uh, uh, the color green, and the entire KEK uh, uh, letter lettering and 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 the entire uh, imagery uh, derives from an internet forum and meme culture. Uh, and it ends up in the capital during the riots uh, uh, as a banner for the protesters. You can finish in about three or four minutes. Yeah. So okay, so so uh, one one way. So so my question was how 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 do we understand this? Uh, and uh, mm, one way of understanding it is that there is a certain shift, a, a parenthesis, so to say, of a literary culture of a linear and scientifically based empirically driven mm, uh, discourse that is unnatural to the human ways of of uh, of understanding uh, and uh, and behaving in the world and, and conducting politics uh, and then according to thomas petit uh, a communication scientist uh, from denmark uh, he argues that a digital culture is a, a kind of a return uh, to a form of uh, public uh, existence and a, a truth regime, so to say, uh, that is somewhat similar to oral cultures. But it is not a traditionalism, it's, it's uh, a hyper-realistic sort of uh, uh, phantasmic uh, gossip culture uh, that emerges online. Now, uh, what I also discovered when studying, when looking into that uh, notion of, of the truth regime, is uh, Lorna Ware. She's she's a sociolo uh, you know, sociologist of health, uh, but she critiqued uh, uh, Foucault's notion of a truth regime, arguing that you know there there's a variety of formulae of truth, uh, uh, conditions of truth, or um, as as uh, Weber. Uh, calls it um, um, give me a sec forgot the, uh, the the Weber's term for uh, for that but anyway the, uh, so the, the, there's actually a plural regime of truth there, there are various strands of truth uh, legitimation and and uh, mm, and establishment uh, strands that that uh, compete over over uh over our public reality so to say uh and uh, this gave me an idea that there is some kind of an, uh, a symbolic uh shift and, and rupture between two types of 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 narrative construction uh one the traditional modernist uh veridic uh truth regime uh, the opposite of which would be perhaps uh error, empirical error, misrecognition, uh, and uh, another uh, coming uh, that, that's emerging and, and that, that manifests through, through these uh, things that I talked about is, uh, is the symbolic uh, truth formula that relies on representation and uh, functions in a somewhat different mode of, of, of uh, truth establishment, right? And uh, uh, just to to illustrate uh, quickly, here are uh, several. Well, th there are four formulae that Bayer talks about. But just to, to cut it shorter, uh, I want to show the example of of two ways of communicating the crisis according to these uh, uh, truth formulae that uh, that I found. And one is uh, relies on scientific knowledge, and uh, you know uh, the the rational practices of, of how to cope and manage uh, the pandemic. And another uh, relies on symbolic representations and blaming uh, or, uh, or projecting uh, of, a, of a disease upon an, an, an object, in this case, China, uh, which- If you could reach a conclusion. Dealt with, sorry? If you could reach a conclusion. Yeah, uh, dealt with uh, in, in uh, uh, some, perhaps symbolic ways. 
Um, so yeah, so so to conclude, uh, mm, I think that uh, the pandemic showed the rupture of these uh, mm, of, of these narratives that, and I haven't managed to talk about the other two, but but I leave you with this meme mm, of of uh, what happens when 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 the enlightened truth regime kind of dims when the enlightenment dims in, in, in the pandemic and we see different ways of constructing truth uh, gaining political power and momentum so i tried to uh perhaps uh, you know improvise and adapt chris's uh uh categories of of types of people uh to this meme but uh, i leave you with the with it uh, for 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 your own analysis Thank you very much, Arvidas, um, for this um, interesting presentation. We have uh, Maggie O'Neill as a discussant here, and uh, Chris, I guess, had to leave. So Maggie, if you could um, you. do it in three or four minutes, maybe. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Arvidas. I really, I really enjoyed reading the paper, and I really enjoyed um, listening to your presentation. Um, really stimulating. Um, in terms of examining um, the divergent truth formula um, with a focus on um, COVID-19 pandemic and its crisis management. Um, and I think, you know, the way that I, what I enjoyed about the paper is the way that you extended the scope of Foucault's work on truth regimes um, and very eloquently articulated, you know, the sort of struggle for domination among truth oriented knowledges. Um, and it made me think about a lot of things, you know, it kind of, I was kind of moving backwards between and forwards between my own kind of very um, ethnographically founded research with migrants currently. Um, but also, um, I was thinking the, the, uh, the section in your paper on post truth and the articulation in your presentation on post truth. Um, it was very, um, you know, resonant. Um, in relation to David Beer's work, and I don't know whether you're familiar with David's work. Um, he is an editor of co uh, Theory, Culture and Society, um, but he, he explores how transformations in technology and media have reshaped culture and society, um, including work on the, the sort of politics of data and metrics, the social power of algorithms, um, but the sort of dynamics of social media and mobile devices, and I'm, I'm not sure if Janos is going to be talking about that part of his research tomorrow. Um, but I, but I think um, you know it also relates to Paul's point about the, uh, the sort of mega machine, you know, because David um, he he draws on Nick Shrisnek's, and that's probably a terrible pronunciation, his um, book on platform capitalism. So where um, Schnizek argues that the foundations of the economy are kind of, you know, being carved up by a small number of uh, high tech firms, you know, multinational tech firms, Google, uh, Microsoft. Um, and when Paul was speaking about the sort of mega machines, I was thinking about the, for us in the university, you know, in the academy, uh, the kind of mega universities, you know, the elite cyborg universities that um, Scott Galloway and I've forgotten the name of the other guy who's writing about them. But anyway, coming back to David Beer, he argues that data analytics, so the, the example of the Cambridge Analytica, um, you know, kind of, you know, example of the harvesting of data from Facebook. Um, he, he argues that data analyt analytics uh, exercise two types of power. The first that based upon um, the use of people's data to shape or tailor the world that we encounter. Um, and I guess, you know, that's kind of resonant in social media feeds, you know, the echo chambers we live in on Twitter or Facebook. Um, and he describes this as kind of part curation or part manipulation. You know, they try to know us through our data. Um, but then the sort of, and also that this kind of cements or amplifies the world views and it really refer, relates to your use of Chris's typology, you know, and, and the kind of 
also what he was saying in his paper about cults, I suppose, you know, you could extend it to that, but also a second type of power. And it really resonates with what you were talking about in terms of performative, performativity and the imagination. So the second type of power is based on the way that the data, the way that the possibilities about the data are, are, are imagined. Um, so, so he summarizes this by saying, the aim is to project a kind of authority upon those using these types of data analytics. So that authority then lends them political capital. Um, and so, you know, I mean, from a university perspective, we see this in the audit culture metricization and what's happening in Leicester and Liverpool currently in the UK. Um, um, and so I suppose, you know, for me thinking about this, thinking about David's, you know, the way that he articulates data analytics and the power of that and the sort of political authority um, that emerges from um, the sort of, you know, this, the power of data analytics. Um, how would this relate to the theory you outline in relation to veridical, symbolic, governmental and the mundane. You know, from my from my reading of David's, I would say it's a good example of governmental truth for, you know, formula, you know, that the power apparatuses are devised by authorities to manage and conduct the relations between people and things. But they're also veridical and symbolic potentially as well. Um, but um, but anyway, that's my kind of comment. I really enjoyed the paper. Um, I, you know, I could sort of see all sorts of possibilities in terms of, you know, discussing this with students, particularly as well, you know, just in the in our modules. Um, yeah, I'm probably rambling now. I, I, I'm getting Zoom fatigue, but definitely not fatigue with your paper, which was great. Um, Thank you very much for, for, for such a kind... Is, kind is possible, um, a very short answer, Arvid? Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> then a very short question. Uh, do you think theory, culture, and society would be interesting in publishing something uh, around those lines that I discussed? I, I I think so, sure, yeah. And and also, if you if David's got a really great blog as well, so if you I'll put his his um, name and link in the chat right. um, so that folk can have a look. Um, but he's written quite a, 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 one book on data. I can't remember what the last book he wrote was, but it's an extension of this work on data analytics. Okay. Well, but it resonates. It resonates really well with with what you're doing here, and and I think you know, um, you know, you're taking the sort of theoretical, you know, kind of notion around truth formula and truth regimes, uh, maybe a step further. So it might be nice to have a conversation with him. Well, I'd love to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Roger had uh, his hand raised, and um, I wasn't sure whether it was for Arvidas or for Daniel's uh, previous talk. And in the meantime, Roger, um, you, you sent your, your comment on, on the chat. Would you like to say a few comments, uh, perhaps, Roger? Oh, yeah, sorry, I was yeah. I muted myself. I, I, I've, I've had far too much time. Don't, I, I've dominated far too much another white, walk, uh, white talking head. But I would like to refer to, again, stuff I've read when I was a teenager. Uh, the Myth of the Machine, Lewis Mumford, it, again, acquires great prophetic, this is long before the internet or the sort of technocracy we've got now. Uh, in, and it's an attack on the domination of the mega machine. And I mean, this is just sums it up in a, in a comment on it. In the myth of the machine, Mumford insisted upon the reality of the mega machine we were already living on in the 1970s. I see so much of my life now as revisiting from an academically informed point of view, my gut feelings when I was listening to Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell in the 1960s, which were my only salvation in those days. In those days, hippie sentiments and presentiments about the, the catastrophic nature of modernity were not articulated through science very much. And now there's a whole wonderful, and this conference is part of it, uh, there are disciplines now formed from the interaction between disciplines, which are actually giving us conceptual tools to, to articulate what's happening, which is like a modern equivalent of what was happening at the end of the 19th century and when pe people didn't understand the impact of industrialization, which produced people like Durkheim and, and Max Weber. So I, I, and I see as part of my heroes, uh, Anthony Giddens, a modern hero for me, who gets a lot of this stuff, his critique of expert systems, which we know can fail, that's 
consequences of modernity, again, before the internet age. But this wonderful statement about myth in the machine, the convergence of science, economic, economy, techniques, and political powers, a unified con community of interpretation, rendering useless and eccentric life enhancing values. Yeah, that's a very hippie thought that, that un unwittingly, all these various areas, this is very Giddensian as well, all these various areas of, tech, of expertise and technique. And of course, there's Jacques Ellul, uh, 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 you know, writing about la technique as a sort of technological civilization. Incidentally, the Unabomber uh, was the, the, the American Unabomber who used letter bombs because he didn't have access to modern terrorist technology. Uh, if anybody's not read his diatribe against technical civilization, I mean, again, it's quite extraordinary. He ended up in jail for it and, and blowing up people's hands in university car parks, but the intuition again is all, and he was influenced by these anti-technological uh, experts at the time in the 1960s and 70s. Subversion of this authoritarian kingdom begins with that area of human contact with the world that cannot be successfully repressed, one's feelings about oneself. And I think that that statement resonates with a lot of what we've heard this afternoon about- Indeed. Which somehow, you know, again, I, th I think we've got to, you know, I would love somebody, I mean, my life's, I'm running out of life, but I would love to see a new generation of postgraduates burrowing back into the past to reinterpret and rediscover some of the amazing poets and intellectuals of the past, even the Leviathan by Hobbes reads in a new way now, the idea of the state as a Leviathan long before the technocracy. Oh, uh, we, we could re reinterpret, we, to go back to our roots as humanistic academics in the war against the mega machine, you know, and that is like a science fiction as well. Even things like Terminator are extraordinarily powerful modern metaphors for the cinema going public about, I mean, a world where robotic weapons have actually forced human beings underground. You know, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I just think all these intu intuitions are there and education is empowering the next generation to actually use the right conceptual and imaginative tools to understand what's happening to their lives. Does that make sort of sense? Well, that certainly. Resonate certainly. with what everybody's been saying in certainly. a way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roger, for these um, prof profound comments. And thank you, Avidas.